Hello, I'm Bill Merrington. I'm the chaplain at Bournemouth University. And with me today is uh, Gary Hazel and Abdullah al Andalusi, And we're going to have a conversation together um, about life in Britain and how it relates to people who are uh, from the Islamic faith. Let me begin today, uh, and can I just say that we're doing this on behalf of Bournemouth University um, Islamic Society. So Abdullah, let me begin with you if I can. Um, we hear a lot on the television, on the press, that Britain is a multicultural country. Um, and the way it's expressed is that it's a country very integrated from many different cultures. Uh, is that how you see Britain today? Well, I would say that, uh, I mean, growing up in Britain, um, there was, uh, I did experience that there are, you know, there are different cultures in terms of people from different parts of the world, different cuisines and food and so on and so forth. Although you could argue that, that in Victorian times, that was already the case when they were bringing new foods and new cuisines over to the, to the UK, including tea. Um, but uh, to some extent, there is, you know, there's this kind of a tolerance and plurality concerning um, different uh, foods and clothings and so on. But at the same time, there are also issues with perhaps um, Britain struggling with an identity crisis as to how to define itself in a, a kind of post-secular world. And also, there are some, you could say, uh, perhaps paranoias or tensions and issues regarding um, innocuous practices, like, for example, halal meat and, and things like this, and just um, Muslim congregational prayer or just, or just prayer. In some cases, um, women choosing to uh, where a face veil. Um, it's not ubiquitous amongst Muslim women, but some as a minority of Muslim women choose to do so. And there's been some issues. Even though it doesn't obviously impinge upon people's rights, it doesn't impose upon anybody or, or, or force them to change their lifestyle. So in, in some senses, there is, um, there is a multicultural, there is multiculturalism to some extent in the UK. But uh, there are some issues concerning um, practices um, and it's all tied into, I think, Britain's identity crisis and, and in a broader scope, Europe's identity crisis as to what defines British values. Uh, should British values be defined? I mean, they were never defined before in the, in the past um, as formulaic as some of the politicians like to talk about it would seem. So there are some issues which, and these issues obviously we, have to, we all have to work our way through them to find uh, an amicable and peaceful resolution. Mm. I mean, if you were thinking that England, Britain was a, a kind of yeah, you get the picture of multiculturalism as if it's a, a homogenous mixture, like a cake that's all mixed up. But I guess if we really look at Britain, we would find enclaves where people are living from particular other countries where they've come to this country and, and, and have built their contact up in particular little towns and, and areas. Um, do you think that helps integration or, or do you think that actually hinders Britain being, being more multicultural? Well, there's been some uh, long-standing enclaves in the British Isles, uh, namely um, the Welsh, Scottish, and Cornish, if you want to include them as well. Uh, and uh, some of them are very fiercely um, proud of their particular identity, their particular uh, and distinct culture, um, distinct language. Um, so in some aspects, Britain, we, we're used to having enclaves or areas of England where people have different practices or different languages, or even someone might even say the, Mid the, the, the Midlands and the South and the North-South divide is significant as well to some, to some extent in, in, in just how lifestyle and, and uh, attitude mentality. So I don't think it's so much a problem. It's just rather the issue of uh, people being paranoid about other groups or the, you know, for example, um, uh, you know, Jews, Jews live peacefully and amicably in Stamford Hill, uh, tr traditional uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Jews. And, uh, you know, there's no problem with them. No one has a problem with them. Uh, you know, they're uh, a, a peaceful and amicable community. And, you know, if it's OK for them, why not people learn to live with other kinds of communities which have similar practices to Orthodox Jews as well? I don't want to, you know, disrupt or the society or force uh, their practice on anybody else, but to live. And it's natural for human beings for us to kind of congregate around people of our own uh, just mentality, culture, language, or so on. It doesn't mean that you're being divisive. It's just rather you're, you're affirming what you believe with like-minded fellows. At the same time, when you go to your workplace, you're going to mix with people. No one can, can you know, keep, have segregation in the workplace. Jews, Christians, atheists, mm. Muslims are all going, to mm. all going to mix together in the workplace. And that's fine. That's, that's, that's not a problem. But if people choose to live in certain areas, 
Um, I mean, we already have it with the upper class, upper class areas. I mean, the rich live in certain areas. You won't find, you know, um, working class living in those areas. So it's just a natural feature of of of, of humans to say to to force anyone to say you uh, to, to 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 live, uh, you know, in a dispersed way, saying you must, uh, you know, mix with everyone else and and so on is to is, is basically to, to force people to do something that's not really uh, an inclination. If they do it naturally, mm -hmm. that's fine. But if you start forcing it. Uh, then you, 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 you'll kind of come with a kind of almost a, a homogenous vanilla flavored society. Sometimes mm. society is enriched by having differences and even different areas, which I think add to a, add a, create a mosaic rather than just, you know, one bland color. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I can understand why people, when they come to this country, want to live with people similar to them. So, it, I mean, it is understandable. Um, but Gary, let me turn to you. Do, do you look at Britain as a multicultural um, country that's... Uh, working effectively together? <clears throat> I'm not, not quite so sure we're working effectively together, but we're definitely a multicultural country. And when you consider the cons the um, how many different people from different uh, backgrounds have come to this country, that, that's always going to be our future. And there's, it's very unrealistic to suggest that anything else is possible. Mm. But um, what I would say is that multiculturalism only works when certain practices from one culture don't become uh, a conflict or a threat to the rest of the culture. And that's what we have with certain components of either Islam or the cultures of the people uh, that come from their countries. Mm. Um, what, what aspects of threat are you talking about, Gary? Um, for example, you, you mentioned halal slaughter. You, and you described it as an innocuous practice. Um, I would say that uh, halal slaughter, firstly, can only be done by uh, Muslims because they say a, a Muslim prayer. So it's racist not to employ anyone from Britain. Um, Although that would be true for the kosher food as well, I guess, wouldn't sure, it? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't particularly like kosher um, slaughter, but... Mm. Um, but back to uh, halal slaughter, um, I also consider halal slaughter very cruel in, to the animal. I mean, we've mm. spent several hundred years developing a, um, an animal welfare system um, that's designed so that the animal has the least amount of suffering. And now whilst <coughs> having um, religious exemptions for halal and kosher, um, some might argue that that's necessary and if it is fine but one of the exemptions on halal slaughter when it first started in England was that it would only be served to uh, Muslims the same as with kosher the, mm. their exemption yes. and that's that uh, exemption um, has been ignored and it hasn't been enforced by the government um, also uh, because of the exemptions on halal they're able to produce a cheaper product and to a certain extent, they've been able to undercut British suppliers. And we're at a stage now where 30 to 40% of the meat in this country is halal slaughtered. Mm. Um, and a lot of the traditional British slaughterhouses that did exist no longer exist, or they've been taken over by uh, Muslim businesses. Now, again, fine if that Muslim business is there to provide uh, for that religious exemption, just for practicing Muslims, I understand that your faith is important to you and practices within that faith, but I don't feel it should impact on the rest of us and I don't feel it should um, have an effect on the rest of us. Uh, and also, mm. the certification process for halal, um, you give money to uh, charitable organizations, is that correct? Yeah, it is correct. Um, and some of these charities have been linked to groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which have also been linked to supporting groups like Hamas, etc. Now, when I buy something in a shop, I, I don't want to be supporting, uh, possibly, somewhere down the line, terrorist organisations. Now, I, I've never called for the ban of halal slaughter. All I've asked for, and what I've campaigned for in the past, is uh, that halal slaughter be labelled. So any meat or any product mm. that's involved with halal slaughter, 
um, be labelled. And I think that's a reasonable request. Um, also for Christians and maybe Buddhists and other people, um, some of them have expressed an ex a concern that they don't want their food to be prayed over. Yeah. And most of the halal slaughtered meat in this country is unlabeled, so we don't know that it's been slaughtered halal. So mm. uh, with respect, to describe it as an innocuous practice, mm. Mm. Uh, I don't feel it's accurate. But, um, uh, Abdullah, I mean, would, would you, um, presumably, I assume you would probably not have any problems with meat being labeled kosher, halal? Yeah, I mean, um, I, it's not really a problem whether it's labeled or not. Um, for, for, my, for myself, if they want to label it, that, that's fine. However, I suppose there are some contentions I, I, I have with uh, some of the concerns that were raised. Um, basically, if we have a sincere uh, desire for animals not to suffer uh, unnecessarily, right? So the, the key is to say unnecessarily. And so now we have methods like stunning, uh, which uh, enable us uh, to, to not need to, to, to basically cause unnecessary pain. But we have food supplies, which I mean, we don't need to eat meat. It's unnecessary for us to eat meat. We don't have to. If we truly are concerned with animal welfare, then we should embrace vegetarianism, right? If we really want animals not to suffer, I actually, I, I would think that we should arrange a trip for everyone that has an issue with halal to go to um, the normal slaughterhouses or the, the, the bulk standard slaughterhouses and see how animals are kept, yes. treated, and so on. You'll see uh, quite a lot of misery. In fact, um, it might even put people off actually having meat. So to raise this contention that, oh, we care about the animals now, um, I, I find sometimes, I can, I can find among some people to be disingenuous, not, not everyone, um, but I, I find that some people, we're raising this now as an issue on newspapers and, and the media. I think it's just, it's kind of um, uh, fear-mongering and hate-mongering mm. and so on. Mm. I don't think it's racist uh, to, to, to say that only a Muslim can, can you know, produce halal meat. Uh, but a clarification, as Muslims, we can have kosher meat as well. So, um, our, I mean, as long as a, uh, a monotheist has, you know, has, has uh, kind of prayed over the meat okay. and so on, generally kosher meat we can eat yes. and halal meat we can eat. So it's not only um, uh, for, for Muslims mm. and so mm. on. Okay. Um, as for the meat, halal meat going, I mean, as for 30 or 40 percent of the meat supply in the UK being um, halal produced, I, I would contest that. I, I find that, you know, highly exaggerated figures um, and so on. I, it actually costs more. To produce halal meat than it does to have it, um, f you know, mm. slaughtered by mechanically because a person has to basically slaughter mm. every animal by hand. Mm. Whereas mechanically, you press a button and all these uh, poor animals are sent into a machine and are and are basically mm. uh, slaughtered uh, mechanically and so on. So, um, I, I would actually say it's actually cheaper to have normally produced meat. But I think what some business have done because in some areas of the UK um, there's a high Muslim population, and these businesses want to take. Um, uh, they want to take business away from competitors who are, let's say, for example, um, uh, Muslim chicken shops, you know, like halal chicken shops. So if KFC, for example, is because it might want to take business away from the, uh, and attract more business for itself, that it will say, OK, we also offer halal meat. And I think as they, as they kind of see it, is that, um, I mean, certainly Christians, even religious, from, uh, religious Christians and, and, and devout Christian opinions, even within the Bible, they can eat um, uh, meat sacrificed to idols. So if they can eat but, uh, meat, meat sacrificed to idols, according to majority Christian opinion, I know some Christians uh, disagree with that, but how much, how much less so would they have a problem with eating a meat sacrificed to, to, to the one God, mm. and, you know, as, as kosher was done? So um, I mean, as for Buddhists, um, I don't know if Buddhists uh, eat meat. Uh, if they're meat eating, I think they're more vegetarian. Yes. And, and, uh, yes. and religious, religious Hindus also are vegetarian and so on. So I suppose that they want to eat meat. They're not really. They don't. They're not really people that are strike us having religious concerns. So I think that the businessmen of KFC and whomever um, decided to have incorporate halal meat in some of their shops, just thought it was it would make good business sense to have halal meat because generally speaking, um, no one's going to die from halal meat uh, specifically. It, no one's going to be converted to Islam just by eating <laughs> halal meat. Where every chicken wing they're becoming more more of a Muslim. So they thought, well, it's just meat. In the end of the day, if you're a, if you're a religious, if you're an atheist, it doesn't matter what someone whispers in their mouth as they're as they're doing their job, uh, as long as they're doing their job uh, to health and safety standards. So I don't think this is an issue. I do think that there is a concern with, as I said, this description of a threat. How is you know how is it a threat? Is are like people are people's restaurant not people like people's restaurants being invaded by Muslims and the the restaurant owner forced 
at gunpoint to uh, you know adopt halal meat or, or or people who are not Muslim forced to eat halal meat. Sure, um, about issue of labelling. Uh, I mean, th that would probably be the strongest argument that they could pr that c can be presented. Mm -hmm. However, even then, uh, the issue of labelling it is at the discretion of the business. Uh, to do so, it's not like it's a chemical compound or something like this, which, which mm. is mm. Uh, like um, I think uh, s uh, like trans fats, which have to be you know which are actually banned, I think, in Europe. Yeah. So it's not like it's some it's some kind of controversial or illegal uh, chemical compound. It's just meat to the average uh, non-religious, non-practicing Englishman. Well, uh, Britain, Britain has a. Um in the last 50 years, adopted all kinds of food in our country, haven't we? from the from the pizza to the curry. So it is quite hard to work out what is uh, British food these days. Um, but perhaps that leads us into what is Britishness. Uh, the government recently have been saying on their bag wagon, in a sense, saying, "Oh, we need to identify uh, and to um, get a more coherent message about what is British." in this country so that people who live here, uh, whether they've been born here or they've moved here, can really embrace the, the British culture. Uh, do you feel that there's such a thing as Britishness that can be defined? Well, if you, uh, if you want to identify British culture by, let's say, the culture that we have today, or the way generally accepted culture or its most popular culture, uh, for most of Britain's history, Britain hasn't been British. <laughs> Um, British cult. I mean, the Victorians would be aghast at what they see today mm -hmm. as a British culture. In fact, I would I dare wager that the Victorians would have um, would identify more with Muslim uh, religious practices and Jewish religious practices than they would uh, with um, what some people may describe as a, as a more hedonistic culture, possibly, or a more non-religious uh, mm -hmm. culture or a more uh, secular uh, culture. Uh, certainly, religion was very important and uh, it was very much part of um, British fabric uh, of, of, of the UK for, for centuries mm. and has, and has inf informed their laws, their outlook. Even the British language uh, has been affected by uh, the King James Bible mm. and, and its language. And uh, as I said, I actually have no problem with uh, the tra tra traditional Christian foundation uh, of, of the United Kingdom. I think that uh, religion actually helps make uh, a country better by giving it moral values based upon something concrete, not just something arbitrary, as the saying of a politician or the, mm. or the a proclamation of, a, okay, well-meaning moralists, but with no substance behind it, or the, or the then exhortations to just be moral because it's nice. Um, yeah, sure, it's nice, but if you, you need to have some kind of foundation. So I actually think that Britain would be better uh, being um, uh, based upon a solidly, you know, Christian foundation, and I think secularism has caused uh, has caused the problem we have today, and I think secularism has caused the identity crisis that we find ourselves today. This this need for British values. No politician in the past has ever said or enumerated what British values are. There was no need to enumerate. Firstly, culture changes over time, of course, but it was just viewed that basically. Um, you know, by being a good, upright individual. In fact, many of the great uh, English uh, playwrights and philosophers have said actually being moral, being virtuous, this is uh, what the characteristics of being a good Englishman. Mm. Not you have to be, you have to stick your pink, pinky up when you're drinking a cup of tea or other such, uh, you know, quaint practices. So I, I think that um, the, what we face today is an identity crisis a po in, in a, in a post-secular world where um, all kinds of uh, meaning uh, and moral value has been stripped away from states and, and countries and has left it empty. And now people are scratching their heads wondering what does it mean to be in this country and part of this country and so forth. So I think this is a question that uh, Europeans... I suppose one of the basics would be language, ask. for example. I mean, do you think everyone in this country who chooses to live here should be expected to speak English? Well, ask the Welsh, uh, the Cornish and the Scottish, I think, um, of that, that question. But you'll get some interesting answers depending on who you speak to. Um, but they also speak English as well as Welsh, or? Uh, possibly, uh, although, I, I mean, in some places in Wales, I've had, uh, they refuse to speak English and, and look down upon anyone that walks in their, their, mm. their area speaking English. Uh, I have many anecdotes of, of uh, friends of mine uh, who've encountered that and were quite, were quite shocked by this. Um, a country can have multiple languages, but what I would say is, yes, uh, th there's, there's no problem with there being, uh, you could say, a universal language for the point of interaction. And as I said, I, I mean, I speak English. It's my mother tongue. I don't have any shame that I speak English or it's my mother tongue. Uh, I, you know, and I've tried to spend my, my life and my education trying mm. to improve my understanding mm. of English to better mm. communicate. Yeah. Um, so well, let, let me bring Gary in here for a moment then. Just what do you think Britishness is? 
Now, if the government's going to teach what is Britishness, what, what, what would it be? I don't think government can teach Britishness, really. Um, um, our values are based on the Judeo-Christian humanist um, uh, grounding that our nation was formed on. Um, it, you know, it's down to uh, politeness, manners, thinking of your friends, family and loved ones, sometimes quite often before yourself, um, thinking of your country and behaving in a way that's not always selfish, certainly in public, which is very different to some other countries. Um, there are lots of things that, that make up the British culture. Um, we could probably talk all day on the subject, but um, one, one thing I did want to talk about that uh, Abdullah mentioned was that um, uh, about values not mm. being, because he feels, as a lot of people uh, who follow a religion feel that Values should be based in the, the Bible or mm. the Quran, or, mm. um, but I would argue that values are not um, based on what a politician says, as you mentioned, but our experiences over the centuries, what we've learned, what we've observed around us. Um, we've learned that if you behave in a certain way, um, it has a positive outcome. Um, it's, it's the very nature of evolution, some might argue, mm. um, and that's how we learn our values, and they quite naturally, uh, over the centuries, they will evolve. Um, and when you have a book that was written 1,400 years ago or a couple of thousand years ago, I feel that sometimes some people who follow the religion, they're, they're held back from evolving their understanding of the world um, because they won't evolve their values because they're, they're stuck on what it says in that book. And I think that's dangerous. Mm. Um, Certainly on values, I think. Mm, okay. Um, Abdullah, we have had very recently had a lot of publicity about the issues in schools. And that has focused, particularly in Birmingham, about, about um, pockets of areas that have perhaps some might say lost, lost its Britishness and, and in which people have tried to change the teaching within those schools to, to really f reflect um, Islamic teaching. Um, do you feel that's appropriate within, within, within British culture? Well, I think if you look at the, the, the recent so-called Trojan horse uh, schools, um, some of them were previously rated as outstanding you know, by, by Ofsted, and they were high achieving. Uh, so they, they delivered in getting students to get good grades in their exams. And these exams aren't set by the school, they're set by uh, you know, examination boards. So you have to get those students to the level to, of understanding on their subjects to pass those exams. And these schools had been achieving that. So in terms of outcomes, uh, uh, you know, values weren't holding back anybody in achieving the outcome. In fact, some might even say that the values were helping uh, and motivating those students who were Muslim to excel. Uh, what, there was never any case in those schools where these schools were being hijacked by extremism or radicalism or any, any of that stuff. There was ne no proof at all uh, uh, on, regarding that. And instead, what was brought against some of these schools was that basically that some of their... Um, uh, you could say some of their uh, assemblies were uh, having an Islamic flavor to it. And some, the argument was that, well, you know, we live in a secular country and you shouldn't have this in schools. Of course, we have faith schools. And mm -hmm. of course, what most people don't realize... Some of them would be Church of England schools. In yes, which yes. Mainly I, Muslims are the, going to the, them. Uh, a, a significant portion of... Uh, in fact, the first schools in, in the UK were actually Church of England. So we have the Church yes. of England to thank for that. Um, but what people don't realize is that by law by a uh, law which all schools uh, which are not exempt um, or haven't got, got an exemption from the government, all schools have to have um, some kind of uh, co uh, collective worship which is majority Christian. It's part of the law. So there is a faith element even by law right now to this day whereby schools, unless they get an exemption from this, must have um, uh, uh, their services or majority you know, Christian. And of course, they, they allow discretion the schools to to apply exemption. I think one of those one of the schools in the, the Birmingham schools, their exemption had had run out and they hadn't hadn't got renewed. And that was the issue that was taken up. Not that there was a faith based uh, service or assembly, but that it was in essence in a way the wrong religion possibly because they didn't, they, their exemption had run out. Now um, I understand where the, this the, that law came from. It came from obviously the Christian past of of the UK and the fact that the first schools were Church of England. So this was this was natural. Uh, for that law to, to exist. 
Uh, but I don't think that, I mean, I think what we should look at, the real question is, is that were these schools, I mean, who the majority of their pupils were Muslim, surely these schools have to uh, adjust their, their their teaching style or a bit, a bit of the environment to, to cater for the needs of the, the pupils. Mm. It doesn't mean now that the the um, non-Muslim pupils must have it forced on them. In fact, if I hear, if I if I ever heard that non-Muslim pupils had were forced to attend Muslim um, <coughs> services or be for, or have Muslim faith forced upon them, then mm. I, I would I would stand right at the front lines condemning that along with everybody else. But if if it's just for Muslims uh, Muslim students to have a bit more of their uh, beliefs and their background uh, catered for uh, without going going against the law, then I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, it doesn't affect their achievement. As Ofsted said, one of the, one of the schools was actually achieved outstanding results yeah. in, in its academic um, uh, examinations and tests. I suppose it raises this feeling that's come out is coerciveness. Something going on underneath, hidden, was the, was the Trojan horse that you're talking about. Uh, is there things going on in Britain that's hidden, which is affecting our culture. Um, I don't know whether, Gary, you feel there's anything going on that's not as truly open as you want in this culture. If I may, I'll answer the point about the, um, the so-called Trojan horse uh, plot. I don't think we should be naive as to call it a plot or use the sensationalised language that newspapers use, like hijacked or anything like that. But the fact is that there are... Um, a lot of schools in towns like Birmingham, Bradford, Luton that are run by um, uh, Islamic organisations and within Islam ex itself there are components that are extreme in nature so what's bound to happen is these components will get through to the schools and indeed there are people within Islam as there are within every culture that um, that lean towards these extreme factions and for example there's one chap who's on a watch list in America forgive me I forget his name but he was he was banned from going into America but um, he managed to get into England and he's he's now a governor at a, mm. uh, a state-funded school in England now someone with extremist views like that running a school is not a good thing um, it's not a good thing for the country or for the Muslim community. So, so what, what bits of extremism within Islam are you talking about here? Components of Islam that are a threat. Mm. Um, for example, some people within the Muslim community might say that Sharia is um, what they consider to be important within Sharia is... Uh, dominant over democracy and democracy is un-Islamic mm. um, and some people might suggest that within the Muslim community uh, that Sharia should even dominate the UK and um, what they consider to be Sharia a lot of Muslims might suggest Sharia is just their sort of internal rules that they give themselves to govern their lives so they can achieve their deen that taking mm. into consideration the mm five pillars of Islam, etc., etc. Yeah. But there are some who, who, who feel that Sharia is something very different, and those people will get into schools because they want to reach the youth. They want to bring a new generation to their way of thinking. And that threat is very real. It's not something that I've imagined, or it's, I'm not suggesting there's some uh, organized plot from certain yeah. groups, although there may be, but... Uh, there are individuals who follow that ideology and uh, the school system should, should look out for them. Mm. But within schools that are run just by Muslims, um, moderate Muslims in England have a tendency not to speak up when these people rear their head. And that's our experience. And I think that's a shame because I would like to see Muslims stand up and say no to these people, uh, people that we can all cheer for, people that we can look up to and so that uh, p people within the Muslim community can integrate better with, mm. with British life. Yeah. Um, but as it stands, we very rarely see people in the Muslim community stand up to these kind of people. And um, that's, a, that's a great loss to our country. Mm. Abdul, Abdul, do you feel, I mean, obviously the recent news is about young Muslims um, going off to Syria or wherever to fight. Um, 
Do you feel the Islamic society, the Islamic, the Muslim community in our country um, is really projecting a strong voice against that? Um, okay, well, I mean, first and foremost, I don't think um, the US State Department and its ban list should dictate to us what is extreme or not in the UK. You know, I don't think American policy should dictate UK policy, we are a sovereign country, we don't, we, don't, we don't run off what their State Department tells us. So if someone is banned, I mean, the, there's, a, there's, a Canadian, um, there's a Canadian speaker called Shabir Ali who only does interfaith debates. He only talks about um, theology, not, not, nothing political at all. And he himself was banned from going to the United States mm. and so on. So I don't think the United States is a good arbiter of what is extreme well, or not. Well, let, let's, let's leave Americans, <laughs> America to Americans. Yeah. But, right. but, you know, but, I, I, there is a question. I think, I think Gary has this question, which is that um, people would like to see the Muslim community stand out and speak out more against some of the negative things and the negative press that we see going on within the world, within the Islamic world, where there is the fight and the young people going out. Well, I mean, there were, there were famous English uh, playwrights that went to the Spanish Civil War and fought um, against the, um, the, the, the uh, fascist government in, uh, in, in Spain. Um, English people going to Sp a Spanish Civil War and fighting, and they thought it was a good cause. No one called them a terrorist. No one uh, said they're extremist. These are English playwrights, famous ones. So I think, that, um, I mean, if you look at the Syrian situation, Bashar Assad is a, uh, a secular dictator, very nasty kind of person, um, and how he treats his people, t torture, execution, uh, uh, um, indiscriminate bombings, uh, and so on of, his, of, of, of Syrian people. So I think that basically, I, I don't think go, people who want to go and fight against him, and some include even Christian, they're Christian Syrians in, the, in opposition to him. I don't think they are extremists or terrorists. I think that they're doing no different to what the English playwrights did when they went to um, you know, the, the Spanish Civil War to fight against fascists. Is, is it healthy for the Muslim community that this is happening? Well, I mean, the, the real question is, is it healthy for the, 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 you know, the Syrian uh, civilians it, it, that is happening, that they have yeah. a dictator over them that ha has brutalized them for, for decades and uh, uh, arrested um, and imprisoned and disappeared, uh, you know, um, mm. thousands of, of people from the Syrian population. So I, I think that's the, that's the more fundamental question. And then the thing is this, if people, I mean, generally speaking, politicians have always wax lyrical about the need to in for military intervention to get rid of brutal dictators in the past. And that's been totally fine. And, and except when it's not them doing it or they don't have, they don't control the agenda. Remember when they, in, in the war against Gaddafi, there was, there were British people going to Libya to the opposition to fight against Gaddafi. But because the opposition from very early on had made a deal with, with, with Britain and, and various other governments uh, that they would kind of, um, uh, they were more under the control of, of, of Western governments. Or oh, suddenly it was okay. Suddenly there was no, no one ever was worried about radicalization, terrorism or, or, or any, any of this. But when it came to Syria, when the government, when the, the Western governments couldn't control the opposition, i.e. by buying them off and having them as, using them as proxies, all, suddenly they're extremists and terrorists. So I think this double standards and hypocrisy is, uh, it, just, it just won't go and we, we shouldn't accept it and we shouldn't um, f be fooled into, the, into this narrative which is, which is kind of spun around us. If I may, Sorry. let's be clear, to go abroad and fight in any field of war in any other country is breaking the law in this country. It's against the law. So the fact that you would uh, stand there and sit there and say that that's okay, uh, that's abhorrent to me, and that's exactly why um, I support the EDL and why I'm with, with the EDL, is we stand against violent jihad, not only in our country, but abroad. And but what was abhorrent about, um, about going to another country to defend the weak and defenseless against um, an oppressive dictator? This country's done it many, many times sure. before. Sure, but with uh, but uh, albeit to those they 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 declared to be um, brutal dictators, they've used that same justification. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, great English playwrights, I believe, was it George Warren and Bertrand Russell, I believe, went to went to it's the, in the Spanish Civil War, fought against fascists. Mm, what, right? They have volunteered. What are they you, replacing um, Bashir Assad with? They're replacing him with uh, uh, the violent jihadist ideology that's wrong. Well, I mean, it says who? What says, says the British government? Says uh, your, your um, speculation on the matter? No, the, the, the Syrian people don't want uh, to replace one 
a dictator with another kind of dictator, the same, same ilk. They actually want a government where they, they feel uh, that they're not afraid of anyone. They don't, they're not subject to arbitrary detention and arrest. Um, many of the groups, and they are, and they are Islamic groups, um, are offer that. And that's what, some of the, that's what pulls right. many, uh, many people uh, there, right. including Christians. And there are Syrian Christian groups in the opposition. It's not, it's not just, mm. oh, this, uh, what, it's just an Islamic jihad thing. Mm. There are Syrian Christian groups who are fighting in the opposition against Bashar al-Assad because he was a threat and a tyrant to everyone. Uh, you know, not just to uh, Muslims of, of one particular ilk in, in, in Syria. So I think it's, it's, it's high hypocrisy. As for the British law, um, I mean, as I said, I don't, I don't, I, I don't tell people to go to Syria. I'm, my only point is, morally speaking, uh, you can't condemn it as being immoral. What you can say is that the British law has been changed to mean, mean it's, it's illegal. But if that's the case, then uh, 50, 60 years ago, would the EDL support uh, you know, the prohibition of homosexuality because that was against the law, you know, in, in this country. So Sorry. must we follow well, the, the law, law right or wrong? I know, but if the EDL did exist back then, is it, is, is it, is it, is the principle my country right or wrong? Now is this is what we're going to do? No, if they no exist. <laughs> we talk about morality, right? We're not talking about um, law here. We, and, and, and morally speaking, it's no different to the fight in, uh, against fascists in um, Spain, the Spanish Civil well, War. I, I feel that the Islamist mm. ideology that the jihadists follow is close to fascism. So uh, yes, it is immoral and yes, it is wrong. And I don't think that Syria will be a better place if they do defeat um, Assad. Um, so I would love to see, uh, mm. you know, in another country, I would love to see uh, Syria ruled peacefully um, by, by people represented by the people. But it's, what, what I mean, can it's, we it's your, in this country it's your do worry. I mean, Syria that? is very complex and yeah, there are sure. Muslims and there are Christians fighting on both sides. Sure. Um, but if we bring it back to our country, Gary, it, it, is your fear that that kind of jihad would happen here one day? Yeah, yeah. Well, it already has. So, yeah. In what sense? Seven Seven, uh, Lee Rigby, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, English people died in uh, America and New York. Mm. Um, I'm sure English people died in uh, Mumbai, etc. Um, the whole world has felt the effect of violent jihad, and. Now, whilst I certainly uh, respect the fact that most um, high high majority of Muslims mm. probably don't support violent jihad, it's also fair to say that jihad is central to Islam, and it's also fair to say that Islam today probably wouldn't exist as it is if there hadn't been violent jihad. So, to suggest that um, that even though most people don't follow it. It's not part mm. of Islam, it's mm. just false. Well, let's, let's see. Okay. Abdul, is, is jihad really central to Islam? Firstly, people would say that Britain wouldn't exist if it wasn't for um, just war a theory, which is the, the, the Western equivalent of jihad. Jihad, best translation would be just war. And um, people, people you know, praise the army and say, without the army, without them, them conducting many wars, Britain wouldn't exist. So, so you excuse to say, one wrong no, with no, 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 no. To, to say that basically that uh, without jihad, uh, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z wouldn't exist. I mean, that, that is, is basically true for most countries. Without uh, the defense or without a force that fought for justice, um, you know, no, no, no just country or no country uh, that at least claims to stand for justice would exist uh, in the world. Um, in terms of the issue of, um, and this is the problem, the issue is you judge the opposition of Syria based on what? Have you spoken to them? Have you had any evidence about what they actually say, what, what they detailed uh, the share out to be? No, you've gone by what the newspapers have told you, uh, by what um, uh, pundits of particular political persuasions have told you, and they have colored your understanding of uh, the, what the Sharia is. And this is the real issue. It's not really the war itself, but rather it's about the, core, the causes uh, of of the opposition and the, uh, of, of of most opposition, which is obviously they want an Islamic system, but the Islamic system they don't view it as a total. It's not a totalitarian system anyway. In your they view, view it not, uh, in practice, in history, and with precedence. Uh, it, they view it as a state that that, that uh, frees them from arbitrary rule of a dictator. It gives it gives rules that protects them from oppression and. And uh, most importantly, non-Muslims are not under Sharia. Even uh, historically speaking, Christian communities, Jewish communities, they had their own law, law courts, their own system. They even had their own semi-autonomous areas where they could um, live according to whatever they wanted to live by. So in that, that level of multiculturalism doesn't even exist in the West. You know, that level mm. of plurality doesn't even exist now in the West. But it was granted because 
Sharia is only for Muslims. It's not for non-Muslims. And as for those people um, you mentioned, uh, the, you said that Muslims don't speak out against extremism in, in, in the UK. The issue is this. My, the problem is not that Muslims don't speak out against extremism or extremists in the UK. The problem is the media keep going to these, uh, you know, uh, is in these obscure individuals. We live in an internet they, age today. Uh, yes, but you know what? Uh, you know, News of the World and the Sun front cover paper isn't in, isn't you know doesn't, doesn't, is not the internet age, right? So, 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 so help help us to, to know. Help us to know then, Abdullah, how how Muslims are speaking out against injustices. Well, I mean, basically, Muslims have always openly and vocally condemned all injustices, whether they were perpetrated by Muslims or non-Muslims, who or whoever. It's just that no one will give them the time of day to hear this. Their scholar after scholar after scholar has uh, condemned terrorism, has, has said that we can't use this as a viable tactic. Uh, some Muslims, and uh, actually some Muslims who are, who, uh, like Osama bin Laden, who borrowed a leaf out of uh, America's book on, when it, and, uh, and even Winston Churchill when he said they bombed civilians, so we can do it too. And we say, no, we do not borrow from other people. We don't, we, we follow what the Sharia says. Osama bin Laden himself admits that he's contravening um, in, in his many in, in his speeches to uh, especially to, in an interview to Al Jazeera, I believe, he, in two thousand and two, he admit that basically Islamic law says you can't kill innocent uh, women and children. But he said it's not set in stone. Um, I believe it is set in stone. I believe that that one thousand four hundred year old book sh cannot be changed. And Osama bin Laden wants to change it, or wants to change rather the commandments of it. I believe mm. it can't be changed. And, I, and it's because I adhered to that book 110% hmm. that I condemn terrorism. I always have. But people like me uh, and those who are way above me, the, the scholars and the, and the great thinkers of, of, uh, of the, the Muslim community, they, no one will give them the time of day. The BBC, the Sun, the, 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 the Daily Mail will not go to them to get their reaction from right. the latest outrage. They will go to one or two particular individuals of whom we know so well, and what, what they will ask them. Hmm. And these people will say deliberately things to make everyone as much, as angry as possible. Uh, okay, well, you might have the same complaint change. about the press, of course. Can I make, um, make a point on that? Um, politician that I'm a fan of, um, Nigel Farage, we mentioned earlier, um, he gets attacked in the press on a daily basis, um, and so does this party, yet they've just won a national election um, because of the internet. Now. The internet is a great tool for free speech and for people who want to mm. pierce the veil of, the, of uh, the powers that be that control this country's narrative. Now, if you have a problem with the powers that be that control this country's narrative, use the internet and other such tools and uh, campaign vocally and get your voice heard. It's very possible to do that. Okay, but, but we, we do don't see any of that from Muslims see, in this country. So, so just a question. When was the last time you Googled Muslims condemning terrorism? I don't know. You see, if you don't search, you won't find. Seek and you shall find, I believe, <laughs> Maxim. You'll find it. But if you don't go looking for it, you won't find it. And if you, if you, build, if you build your opinion on something which you haven't even at least tried to see if it does exist, you won't find If you Google it, I'll guarantee hundreds of thousands of results, thousands of scholars, notables and personalities. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, after 9-11, after 7-7, you couldn't go into a Friday uh, congregational prayer without every Friday without a condemnation of terrorism, a strong one issued by the imams. So we've gone out of our way to, uh, to, uh, condemn, to, uh, to condemn terrorism, to uh, assure the non-Muslim community what is actually Islam, what classical and orthodox Islam stands for. And also what classical and, uh, and orthodox Islam stands for is also obeying the laws of the country or not breaching the laws <coughs> of the country. So as Muslims, so, uh, 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 this is what the Sharia says, this is what the classical Sharia says, not, not modern or a liberal uh, interpretation. The classical understanding of Sharia is that as Muslims, if we go into another, another area, another country, mm. another tribe back then, uh, you can't be treacherous, you have to uh, uh, stick to your word. And as, as Muslims being born in this country, our word is that we have to live by uh, the rules of this country, as long as it's not forcing us to do something evil or bad, obviously, which is which applies to all people of conscience. But uh, we have to stick by the rules. And by people taking, um, uh, by people committing acts of terrorism in this country, they not only breach the Islamic uh, prohibition against killing civilians, but they also breach the Islamic prohibition against, obviously, committing acts of criminality. So and the thing is this: uh, we will, we will, we will stop these criminals from doing this. If you can tell us the secret of how you stop crime in, your, in, in society, if you can tell us how to stop crime in society, how to eliminate all crime in society, and give us that, that secret, we will gladly apply Let's it. Let's try and be specific. One example is 
the, the famous one that the press seemed to attach on to, who I haven't, I haven't brought up, and in my questions that I wrote before mm. this, I didn't yeah. mention him, but someone like Anjan Chowdhury, not one Muslim stands across the road from him and um, voices their, their complaints about him in public. You know, and that's just but, one, one example. Well, I mean, because basically he's so obscure, it's ignore him. we ignore him. He, he, he doesn't deserve, I mean, for some of the antics that he's done, those antics do not deserve our t the time of day from anybody. And if no one gave him the time of day, no one would know he, he, he even existed in so the first could, place. So he can radicalize so people who go out and kill people and you don't feel he deserves the time of day? Um, well, okay. I mean, he himself says, he says that he never, he never exhorts his followers to commit to acts of terrorism. And if, they, if he did, I'm pretty sure so the secret services... No, I'm just saying I'm pretty sure the secret services should, 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 would arrest him. And if they haven't arrested him, then that's a problem with the secret services that we have to ask questions about. Yeah, but I'm not talking right? about secret services. I'm talking well, about other Muslims. Uh, well, um, as I said, the, stand up the secret services, they're the ones... I mean, if someone is inciting people to commit acts of terrorism in this country, then it's the, it's the job of the police and the secret services to protect the public. I'm sorry, if somebody okay? in the EDL said they were going to blow up a mosque, I would call the police. Sure. And so why aren't, why aren't you or other Muslims standing up against someone like Anjan Chowdhury, who's radicalising young, impressionable people and getting them to go out there and commit abhorrent acts? Well, first and foremost, as I said, we don't know that he's, you know, he's radicalizing because he claims that he's, he doesn't, he actually claims publicly that uh, he's against uh, acts of terrorism in his country. So he says, he says that he doesn't. But those are the, that's not the issue that we have. That's not our major issue. The major issue with him is his idea about, for example, establishing Sharia in, in the UK, uh, which we, we just think it's absurd. Uh, and I mean, there are there are Christians who want, who call, talk about establishing biblical law in the UK, but mm. I don't think they're going to get very far. Or the Westboro uh, Baptist so what, Church what, in, in what, America. So, what would be the main message coming out of mosques today about Sharia law? Well, would there be a consistent message that came that comes from the British Muslim Council, or or, or are mosques very individualistic in their thinking? Well. I mean, Sharia, the, the, the core aspects of Sharia, uh, and the core aspects of the, the laws and ideas obviously are agreed upon. And the, 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 there are small issues around that are subject, subject to difference of opinion, which is fine and healthy in any, any society to have difference of opinion amongst themselves. We don't have one central authority like a, a Catholic church or something like this to set this is what established doctrine is or not. Uh, to some degree, that gives us some strength uh, to have that plurality of opinions. Uh, but the, the, And is that also perhaps one of your weaknesses, that it does allow radicals to say things and therefore the the whole group is tarnished by individuals saying things separately no because if people want to want to be divergent they're going to be divergent i mean mm. protestant christianity came from being divergent from catholic church so it just goes to show that if people want to be divergent there's no power on heaven and earth mm. so to speak um uh, short of god that can actually stop them from mm. doing from going their wayward ways so uh, we, we can't stop that and in any society you're going to have people who have uh, a certain psychosis, certain mental problems that will um, uh, kind of give them the proclivity of committing acts of violence. So in, in America, for example, abortion clinics are, are blown up uh, uh, by wayward Christians. Uh, people go into, into gay bars with shotguns, uh, Christians go into uh, gay bars and shoot, uh, you know, uh, gay people, as, as, they, as they call it. Mm. Um, Whereas which like, which doesn't represent... Hang them. Sorry? Whereas Muslims in countries, state-sanctioned hangings for... Uh, gay people. So, um, well, I mean, as I said, I, the, the the countries that in the Muslim world today they are post-colonial creations. Let's uh, which are not let's, really uh, let's leave all those Muslim, particular yeah. issues as as we as we draw things to a close. Perhaps we could finish with one final question, sure. Which is, um, in an ideal world in Britain, um, what what would you like to see develop in Britain in an ideal world over the next? 10, 20, 30 years for Britain with the Muslim community? What would you like to see? Okay, well, I think first and foremost, um, I, in an ideal world, I'd want the media to completely, um, preferably just ignore the Muslim community, focus on the more important problems that they're, they're out there. Um, I, 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 would, I would hope that there'd be understanding to, to, to know that, well, you know, Muslims are humans like anybody else. They have the same concerns, the same desires. Um, the Muslim community, um, uh, I mean, I, I obviously, I, I want them to go about to be able to practice their, their, their religion, um, not impose on others and have no one else impose their beliefs on them. So everyone, in a way, can, can live their own way of life as they, as they see fit. 
uh, no imposition, mm. uh, and 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 not be uh, not feel um, pressured or uh, persecuted or uh, witch hunted mm. or baited uh, by uh, social forces, by media, and so on. So this is what I'd, I'd like to see. I'd like to see people being able to live according to their conscience, according to their beliefs, not imposing on anybody else, uh, but. Also, preferably with great understanding of everyone else's beliefs and mm. ideas, uh, so that you can you can interact and have meaningful interactions and amicable interactions with other people. Okay, thank you. And, and Gary, w what would you like to see in Britain in, in this ideal world in the next 10, 20 years? I would like to see Muslims in Britain stand up to the extreme components in Islam. Uh, for example, female genital mutilation, which is come rife in our country. Um, I'd like to see things like halal uh, labelled. I'd like to see um, Muslims standing up to mosques. For example, in the recent undercover ITV documentary, where 18 out of 52 mosques agreed to marry a 14-year-old child to an adult man. And I'm sure if they, the rest of the mosques actually knew uh, that the undercover reporter, it may have been more than 18 that said yes. Um, but I haven't seen any Muslims call for those imams to be taken from those mosques. I haven't heard any Muslims say that those mosques should be closed down. Um, I would like to see anyone who comes to this country to conform to British values and not bring with them um, components of their own ideology that are a threat to our country and our way of life and our identity. And these are not imagined threats, they're very real. And um, if the Muslim communities in Britain can do that and they can conform to British values and integrate with British life, then as with other communities like the uh, Afro-Caribbean communities, um, that some of the Hindu communities and Sikhs and um, uh, Jewish communities who've settled in with British life very well, mm. You know, there's no conflict with them. Why? Mm. Why is there a conflict with, with Islam and with um, with Muslims in Britain? It's not something okay. imagined. It's okay. it's a very real threat to mm. our to our country mm. and our way of life. Okay. We're just going to have the last ten minutes focusing on on one or two key issues, and uh, to try and see whether between Gary and Abdullah uh, we can find some common ground here uh, in Britain today. Um, Gary, I think you've identified this, that there's some well, quite specific issues that's happened recently within our country that, that people are offended about and don't understand uh, and, and might be judging or misunderstanding the Islamic community by those actions. Um, do you want to just tell us one or two things that, that really has uh, drawn real concern to you recently? Um, recently there was an undercover ITV documentary where uh, 52 mosques where uh, the undercover reporter um, was a, a lady wearing a, a, a hijab or a burqa. She uh, went in and, and spoke to the imam and asked if her 14-year-old daughter could marry uh, a 22-year-old male. And out of the 52 mosques, 18 said yes, it was no problem because it's okay in Islam. Um, a lot of us feel that if the mosque has actually known that undercover reporter, it probably would have been more than just 18 mosques that said yes. But even, even those 18 mosques, I, when, you, when you take child marriage into consideration and forced marriage and what we've seen with uh, Muslim grooming gangs in court almost every week all over the North and the Midlands in England, um, there seems to be something endemic there that's that's based on either the culture or mm. uh, motivated within the religion. Um, either way, mm. it's, it's it's something that's that's abhorrent to our country and it needs to be addressed. Um, of course, we have to recognise the publicity recently has been huge on child abuse within our country, which is sure. of course for fairly general across all cultures. But um, I've done a what, what is the, the, the Muslim answer to that in a British culture with the British law about someone of that age marrying a 14-year-old? It's clearly against the British law. Um, I, I would say that basically, I mean, even in, in, in Muslim countries, um, uh, women tend to be married off 
at an age roughly approximate to what women in, in, in the UK and so on. Sometimes you might say early 20s and so on and so forth. And that's kind of the accepted kind of uh, uh, traditional uh, age. So for, I think for Muslims, I mean, you know, early marriage or uh, marriage at 13 or 14. Now, uh, I mean, we'd be, you know, we'd raise an eyebrow at that as much as anyone else would. However, um, I think there's been a kind of, you could say, a lost in translation kind of a c- cultural aspect. Now, this is very rarely practiced in the Muslim community because most people would say, what's, what's the point of it? But it's not really child marriage. It's more of a, of a, a betrothal where basically uh, a, a family or a parent or father or, or, or mother even uh, wants to betroth their child uh, to uh, an, another child. And um, they'd hope that basically they they bring their their families closer together, and hopefully, hopefully, that the children would agree, would still agree to it when they become adults, and then they would consent, and then it, it could be a proper marriage, it'd be a proper marriage, with the physical aspects of a proper marriage once they've passed the, the age of consent and they are adults. Um, so um, now, I mean, I think that a lot of it, the problem is obviously lost in translation. I mean, betrothal is voluntary. It doesn't really mean anything anyway, um, because until two con- consenting adults give their consent, there is no actual marriage and they can't consummate the marriage and so on. So so that doesn't go against the law, but rather, and this is, which is why you don't see people, you will not see people arrested for that practice, because there is no um, consummation, there is no physical uh, intercourse, which is what the law prohibits in this country. Although we could raise questions with the a current culture we see in the West, and many people have raised this in, in, in the UK as well, uh, it's illegal, sure, but it happens where young uh, teenagers, even even 12 or 11, are having sex at that age with each other in this country. You're it's becoming more and more, more prominent. No, I, I didn't. I explained it. I said that um, it's, it's a lot issue of loss in translation. There's not actual marriage. It's not an actual marriage. That's not true. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a betrothal. There, there is no consummation of marriage. There is no moving in did or any that, of that stuff. Did you watch that undercover show that on, on, on OTV? Uh, yes, I watched the undercover show. And yeah. Did you see the Imam say... And that wasn't the first documentary about it either. No, There's sure. been a whole number but of... Did ones. you see the Imam clearly say to the lady, the undercover reporter, that it'd be no problem for them to move into the house together? That, well, that goes against what you just said, doesn't well, it? Well, as I said, I mean, generally speaking, with betrothals, they don't move into the house with, with each other. But even if they did move into the same house, as long as there is no intercourse, as long as the parents of that child uh, give consent, uh, it's not actually a, against the law. It's odd. It's strange. Yes, but it's not actually against British law or Sharia law. That, that's, but it's strange, of course. Yes, I find it a bit odd, but it's not breaking the law. And the issue here we're trying to look at is what breaks the law. There are people who basically, they, they let their, their, their child live with, a, with an, an, another family or maybe orphans will live with another family. I mean, it's not strange for uh, a child living in a house which is not their biological parents. But I would find it odd in that circumstance, but it's not breaking the law. And that's what we need to look at. Mm-hmm. As what I, I, I one thing that perhaps... an indefensible yeah. position. That's just... No, because what you're saying flies in the face of British values. It's wrong. No, 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 because the, the law is what we look at, right? You, you said this. We have to reflect. We have to respect British law. And in that situation, um, as long as no law breaking has occurred, as long as intercourse would only happen between two consenting adults, but that's not the that's case. What here, we look at. That's what we look at. Well, if there is any case, and I don't think that show didn't say that. The show didn't say that that it happened or that the imam didn't encourage them to to to, Why to else do would it. A young girl move in with a young man. It's betrothal. Uh, 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 many cultural practice. It's a cultural practice, not just amongst uh, amongst some uh, um, uh, parts of the Muslim world. It's, mm. it's, in it's, other a, it's parts. an Eastern practice. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, it even used to be an old an old English uh, practice back in the day. In uh, fact, maybe maybe you could uh, say that's let's, British let's values. Two another. years ago, there was a, in Bradford uh, another documentary uh, involving a, a a retired police captain who talked about two thousand plus cases of forced marriage with children from the Pakistani community. So. It's forced marriage is against uh, is against Sharia law and um, all the laws that I, I know of. You can't force someone to be married. There was a case when when a, a, a girl approached the Prophet Muhammad uh, and he asked her. He said he, sorry, she she said to him, "My father forced me to get married to my husband." And so the Prophet said, "Do you you know? Okay, I'll, I'll grant you divorce." And she said, Perhaps. "Well, she said, uh, well, she said, no, I actually like my husband, but it was for the principle." And that established amongst, I mean, that that case established a precedent that basically uh, you cannot force anyone to be married in Islam or, or, or anywhere Perhaps else. And we condemn it as much as uh, as as. Uh, Perhaps you don't understand British would. values. I mean, if an adult marries a child, that is considered forced marriage, and whether you agree with that or not. 
that's the way we feel? Well, I, well, I mean, as I said, uh, I, I don't think Muslims could go to the, to the, the, the local registry and have uh, an underage marriage. I don't think that would be accepted. Of course not, right? But um, we're not discussing uh, that. We're discussing forced marriages in the sense which happens whereby mm. a girl or a man or a boy is forced to get married to someone else. Sometimes it's from a, a, someone back home. It doesn't just happen in the Muslim community. It happens, it seems to predominate in the Asian subcontinent. So it's not re only related to, uh, it's not related to Muslims per sure. se as a religion. Yeah. It's related to actually just a, a, a local, yeah, a specific uh, local uh, problem. Let me just draw us on here because we're going to have to close in a moment. Um, Gary, if there's one thing you want to see from the um, Muslim community, what is it? I want to see people standing against things that we consider wrong, uh, people that we can cheer for, people that we can embrace as part of British culture and British life, right. yes. that want to integrate with British life. And I, when, um, for example, groups like uh, Need for Khalifa do a, a campaign for self-rule in Bradford, or something ridiculous like that, um, I want to see Muslim people stand up to them mm. and I want to see mm. people that we can cheer for that, 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 that want to be part of Britain that mm. don't want mm. their separate lives and their, uh, their mm. separate states almost yeah. and there's been several campaigns like that but I, you hardly see anyone standing against mm. it apart mm. from the English yes. Abdullah, have we, have we just missed them or does the Muslim community lack key leaders that can be recognised um, clearly we don't control the press um, but are the key leaders who are speaking out against injustices in this country? As I said earlier on, um, by the thousands, uh, on all levels, uh, it's just that you won't hear uh, you won't hear them because it's not newsworthy. So where, it's where, do we, where do we need to find them then, Abdullah? For the, for the, you know to build relationships here, uh, Gary said he's looking for a cheerleader from 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 the Muslim they're, community. They're just a Google search where do we find them? They're just a Google search where you'd sorry, you'd, 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 sorry, you you haven't know, even done know, a Google search on it. We know right? how to use the internet. Aren't All right, we, um, there were such people we, we would uh, well, be posting about them because we would think, oh, they're on us. They're, you know, on the side of the British. Well, I, I'll give you an example, right? So, for example, I've engaged with English Defence League before, right? And I've con I condemn uh, a lot of their con what, what they what they are concerned about. I I con I've, I've made public my condemnations. Yet they still call me, they still called me an extremist, and they still called me uh, a, a fundamentalist, and so on. So even Muslims who are condemning these things, uh, you will you will condemn. But but there was one something you said. I think is very important. When you said, "What do we want? What do we want from the Muslim community?" and you said, "We want them to condemn things that we th think are wrong," that is wrong, because you can't define for other people what they should consider to be wrong. It's the okay. issue, no, the issue that we should be concerned with is that law and order is is, is maintained. People in, in, should stand up for what they think um, is right and wrong. Uh, but you can't impose your understanding of right and wrong on someone else. That's the problem. That's where the imposition happens. That's where you're forcing. Mm. What if I said, what if I said... But you're both that saying, aren't you? You're both, it seems to me, you're both saying that actually um, Muslims and non-Muslims should obey the British law as it stands today. Yeah, they should, they should uh, uh, you know, not commit acts of criminality, violence, killing, stealing, all that stuff. They should obey that law. It's, you know, as if you live in this country, uh, you know, you're under uh, in Islam mm. and according to Sharia, we believe we're under a covenant and we, we make a covenant with the country or as Rousseau would say, a contract citizen, <laughs> a contract yes, with, yes. With, with the country that we, we will abide by the laws in return for security and protection, which is what the state does. And that's what that is the limit of what we should be expecting. Uh, for Muslims, if you say, ah, but well, I have my personal tastes, we'll, we'll that leave it is there. Sorry, but our on laws the, on that, on are that. based in what we consider right and wrong. So how do you uh, differentiate between the two? Well, as I said, as long as uh, we, uh, Muslims are happy to obey the law, as long as we're not forced. For example, if the law said you must, everyone must eat pork, mm. that would be a problem. That that would be then Muslim no would, would that, that would be uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So all laws which are uh, which are basically uh, conscionable and most generally most laws are you know no, don't commit violence, act, stealing, murder, and so on and so forth. These laws that we, we all have to follow and we and we all we, mm. we all have to obey. And if we just if we if we followed these laws and we didn't impose on each other, you'd be surprised at how well society can actually get on as long as we don't have a problem. We only have a problem if we make it a problem. Well, on that one point that we do agree that we believe in obeying the laws at this current time, Abdullah. And Gary, thank you very much thank for, you. For, for contributing. Thank you. Cheers. Well done. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, nice to meet you. Well done.